Omar, briefly, when did you found the campaign? Um, the Palestinian uh, academic and cultural boycott campaign was founded in 2004. Um, and since then we've achieved quite some progress, especially among British academics, mm -hmm. as we have a partner in Britain called BRICUP, British uh, Campaign for Universities of Palestine, British Committee for uh, Universities of Palestine. And uh, with our partners we've been pushing for uh, an institutional boycott of Israeli uh, universities in Britain. And now there's wide support in the main academic union in Britain, the UCU, University and College Union, for such a, a boycott. Uh, although the latest resolution in 2009 did not directly adopt boycott because it was criminalized by the Zionist lobby after failing uh, to, to convince people not to support boycott, they resorted to the stick, big thick stick of the law. They said that a boycott of Israeli academic institutions would constitute an infringement on the anti-racism laws in Britain. Absolutely incoherent uh, charge, uh, illogical, but they have the power to make it stick. People got scared. People got scared and the lawyers of the UCU adv advised the membership not to support a boycott of universities as such because that will get them into legal trouble. So they adopted something that's um, a detour but nonetheless, it adopts the logic of boycott. They even adopted the idea of having a BDS conference in Britain this fall, an inter-union conference to debate and discuss the boycott and how to implement it and so on. Um, so we've achieved that. In 2005, uh, Stop the Wall, Pack B, the academic uh, cultural boycott campaign, uh, Badil, the right of return uh, organizations, uh, Pingo, and Almost the entire Palestinian civil society adopted what, what now we call the BDS call, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions call. That was on 9th of July 2005. More than 170 political parties, unions, organizations, mass movements joined that call. So if there's any one political statement that truly and deeply reflects the opinion of Palestinian society, it's that, the BDS call. We have not had any document in decades that has the support of this many um, um, groups in the political spectrum and social spectrum and from all three segments of the Palestinian people. Palestinians in the occupied uh, territories of 1967, Palestinians who are citizens of Israel, as well as Palestinians in the diaspora, the exilic communities, the refugees, who are the majority of the Palestinians. So the BDS call was a wall-to-wall -wall support, it had wall-to-wall -wall support in Palestinian civil society, and that gave it a lot of strength. Um, since then, we've achieved um, a lot of progress among unions, especially in South Africa, in Scotland, in Ireland, in England, uh, in Belgium, in Norway, in, in several countries, even in France, in Canada, of course. Um, so the, the trade union movement, uh, has really seen this um, um, boycott call as something they can mobilize around and they can work around in order to, to When you say that trade, unions, trade unions can mobilize, mm -hmm. uh, mobilize against companies which are involved in uh, Israel occupation, Israeli occupation? There are many ways. Uh, BDS does not come in one size that fits all. It's uh, very flexible depending on the context, of course. So in um, Britain, for example, which is the most advanced BDS uh, state uh, supporting BDS, uh, the major unions like Unison, Unity and, and others uh, with millions of members have supported BDS in, the, in a sense that they will boycott Israeli products. Uh, they've called for boycotting Israeli products. At the UCU, the University and College Union, they're, they're calling for a, or they're endorsing the logic of boycotting Israeli universities as well as banning uh, selling weapons to Israel, which is a, a point I will get back to uh, regarding India. Uh, in Scotland, in Ireland, they adopted the BDS call as is, and the way they implement it is mainly through a boycott of not just Israeli products, but also divestment from companies that are profiting from the Israeli occupation and oppression of the Palestinians, which is a very important point. Hampshire College in the US has decided to, to divest from six companies that are profiting from the Israeli occupation. So divestment is extremely important. Another success story we've had is with a, a campaign, in the BDS campaign, we have a campaign focusing on Veolia and Alstom, called Derail Veolia and Alstom. Um, 
it's uh, of course Veolia and Alstom are involved in, in more than 50 countries around the world in various public works projects that are extremely huge. Uh, our campaign was specifically um, uh, okay. Our campaign was specifically focused on uh, the Jerusalem Light Rail project, which Veolia and Alstom are involved in. This project aims at connecting Israeli colonies on occupied Palestinian territory with Jerusalem, part of which is, is uh, occupied. So this is indirect infringement of the Fourth Geneva Convention. It's not just a violation of international law, it's a war crime. Getting involved in a war crime is itself a crime. Um, so we started um, pressuring Veolia and Alstom to withdraw from the Jerusalem uh, light rail. Our partners in Sweden, France and Britain in particular have cost Veolia specifically um, more than seven billion dollars so far. Seven billion dollars. In contracts. Uh, of course some of it is due to Veolia's incompetence but a lot of it is due to the political pressure as well, especially in Sweden and Britain where it's, there's been a lot of work on raising awareness. Uh, just recently, a few days ago in Melbourne, Australia, uh, also Connex, which is a subsidiary of Veolia, was dumped. It's no longer handling the metro in, in Melbourne, uh, Australia, which is another huge contract. So Veolia is really losing billions of dollars. Alstom, we haven't had any success yet in isolating Alstom, but it's, it's coming on our agenda. Uh, we've approached uh, the Saudis, who have a huge project for Alstom, the Iranians as well, the city of Tehran has projects. The city of Tehran, the mayor of Tehran at least, announced that he will start phasing out Veolia and Alstom out of the Tehran projects. So well, we are achieving course, some... The problem of course in Iran is they're already under sanctions from the American companies. Right. So therefore they are in that the choices are fewer. choices are limited. Yes, but the choices are limited. Other Saudi Arabia has no such problem. Uh, true, but what we're saying to the Iranians is that supporting Palestinian rights, especially Jerusalem, cannot be a verbal exercise. Uh, you have to put, you know, your money where your mouth is, or not put your money where your mouth is. Mm. But in this case, they're really subsidizing Alstom. Yeah. Exactly. So, so withhold money from Alstom, yeah. a company involved in colonizing Jerusalem. I mean, how worse can it get? Yeah. Uh, especially Saudi Arabia, they're connect uh, Alstom is connecting Mecca and Medina, the holiest two cities of Islam, while colonizing the third holiest city of Islam, Jerusalem. So it's, it's really uh, extremely ironic that Saudi Arabia is opening its doors to Alstom. We're applying pressure, uh, even the PLO is now applying pressure on the Saudi government to kick Alstom out. Saudi Arabia. Um, and we understand in India, of course, Alstom is a, is a big company involved in trains and, and public transportation and so on. More than that, it is in the power area also. It's one okay. of the major power sub equipment supplies in India mm -hmm. with the collaboration with Bharat Heavy Electricals for the supercritical boilers. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a big player in India at the moment. Mm -hmm. 